Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Head over there to get your piece of sports history today. In the autumn of 1956, Will Chamberlain was preparing for his sophomore year at the University of Kansas. He got into his brand new Oldsmobile convertible. Then he drove from his home in Philadelphia to Lawrence, Kansas, where the university is located. There was just one problem. Everybody knew full well that Chamberlain could not afford a car like that. So where and how did he get it? This is a story of the college recruitment of Will Chamberlain. And this is Basketball History 101. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today, we bring you the story of the college recruitment of Will Chamberlain. Pretty much everywhere that Chamberlain went for his entire basketball career brought some sort of controversy. Some of it was his own doing, but a lot of it was brought to him because he was such a fantastically gifted player that made many people jealous. Chamberlain dominated basketball ever since he was a kid. Both of his parents are only 5 foot 8, so it does not make sense that he grew up to be 7 foot 1. None of his siblings are anywhere near as tall as he was. But in the mid 1950s, as Wilt was making his way through high school, he was just different than even other people who were in the neighborhood of 7 feet tall. The most famous giant from the early days of the NBA is, of course, George Mikan at 6 foot 10. In his day, Mikan was unstoppable. What Chamberlain brought to the position was an over the top athletic ability. He was not just some tall goon like many other seven footers before him. He had some real athletic skill. The guy ran track and dominated the high jump. After he retired from the NBA, he went into volleyball. Many say that had he played volleyball instead of basketball, he would have been a Hall of Famer in that sport. He was quite literally taller, stronger, and faster than every player who came before him. Now, every player in the NBA is a world-class elite athlete, but even by NBA standards, Will Chamberlain won the genetics lottery. Because of that, every single college coach in the country wanted to have Will Chamberlain on his team. He had hype and potential like nobody before him. Sometimes you hear about young players today being referred to as having a high ceiling. Well, you could not even see Chamberlain's ceiling. He had achieved a mythical status. He was Goliath. Every team in the NBA knew about him when he was still playing high school ball at Overbrook High School in Philadelphia. But back then, there was a rule that nobody could enter the NBA until his college class graduated. Seeing as Chamberlain graduated high school in 1955, it meant that he could not enter the NBA until the fall of 1959. Even NBA teams were trying to influence where Chamberlain went to college, and there was one simple reason why. The Territorial Draft. I have talked about the territorial picks in previous episodes, so here is a quick rundown. A territorial pick meant that any team in the NBA could forfeit their regular first round pick in order to just take a college player that played within 50 miles of their home arena. This meant that the Knicks could just take any New York area college player regardless of what any other NBA team thought about it. The Boston Celtics were in a great position because there are so many universities in the Boston area. 
If any of those players showed some real potential, then the Celtics could just take that player. That is how the Detroit Pistons got Dave DeBusher. It was because DeBusher played at the University of Detroit. The Pistons had the first rights to him. Anyway, you might see where this is going. Every NBA team wanted Chamberlain to go to college in their city so that when he graduated from college, that NBA team could just take him. So the Celtics really wanted Chamberlain to choose a school in Boston. The Knicks wanted him to choose a school in the New York area. And the Philadelphia Warriors wanted him to stay home and go to LaSalle University or Villanova or Temple because all three of those schools are right in Philadelphia. Once, when Chamberlain was still in high school, he was up at Kutcher's Country Club in upstate New York. He worked there in the summers as a bellhop and a waiter in the dining room. Kutcher's was famous as a place where NBA players would go in the summertime to play pickup basketball. Red Auerbach, the head coach of the Celtics, also went to Kutcher's every summer to work with these NBA players. He would stay there for free in exchange for putting on a basketball clinic every day for the kids that were staying at the club. He would also coach the Kutcher's basketball team when they played against the other country clubs in the area that dotted the Catskill Mountains. Chamberlain played on that team. He was the only high school player on a summer team filled with NBA players and coached by the great Red Auerbach. It was a dream situation for any high school player. So one summer, Auerbach was there and looking forward to get a chance to coach Chamberlain. Auerbach was going to have a private session with Chamberlain and Neil Johnston, the reigning NBA All-Star from the Philadelphia Warriors and the three-time defending NBA scoring champion. Auerbach could easily see that Chamberlain had a ton of potential and he wanted Chamberlain to work with an NBA All-Star in Johnston to give him a taste of what it was going to be like to play center at the NBA level. Now normally it would be unwise to put a high school player, no matter how good he was, in a one-on-one -on -one situation against the NBA's leading scorer. Well, Chamberlain absolutely dominated Johnston. I mean, it was not even close. Here was the NBA's leading scorer and an all-star, and he just got destroyed by a high school player. After that session was over, Auerbach was trying to convince Chamberlain to go to Harvard. That way, the Celtics could use their territorial pick in 1959 and just take Chamberlain and put him alongside Bill Russell. Now think about that for a moment. Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain on the same Celtics team? That's just too much. Of course, it did not work out that way. Chamberlain was not going to attend Harvard or any other school in the Boston area. But you have to give Auerbach credit for trying. Now, this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back with the rest of the story of how Chamberlain was recruited to college. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hi everybody, Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold. 
you know, within reason, garage sales, probably not. So go <laughs> ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports. Welcome back to the show and let us get back to the story of how Will Chamberlain was recruited for college. Before the break, we shared how even NBA teams are trying to have influence over where Chamberlain went to college so that they could use their territorial pick to take him once he finished his college career. Red Auerbach even tried convincing Chamberlain to go to school in the Boston area so that the Celtics could draft him in 1959. But Chamberlain was going to do his own thing. The one thing that Chamberlain really did not like is being told what to do. He did what he wanted to do, which is probably what ruffled people's feathers throughout his career. Schools around the country were visiting the Chamberlain family in Philadelphia. They were offering money under the table. They were offering jobs and houses for Chamberlain's parents. They were offering cars and pretty much whatever he wanted. Of course, all of this was completely illegal and against NCAA rules, but those coaches were willing to take the risk in order to land Will Chamberlain. The way that every coach viewed the situation was that whoever landed Chamberlain was going to win at least two national championships. That is how good Chamberlain seemed to everyone. While all of these schools were offering everything under the sun to get Chamberlain, Eddie Gottlieb, the owner of the Philadelphia Warriors, proposed a rule change to the territorial pick. He proposed that if a player was not coming directly from a college, then the territorial pick could be based on where the player grew up. If you recall, Will Chamberlain grew up in Philadelphia, where the Warriors were also located. I have no idea why the other owners agreed to this rule change. They must have all known exactly what Gottlieb was thinking. He wanted Chamberlain, and they just let Gottlieb have him. I have no idea why they would have done that, but they did. I guess they were thinking that at some point in the future, they could do the same thing when the next Chamberlain came along. In the meantime, Chamberlain still needed to figure out where he was going to college. When it was time to announce, Chamberlain shocked everyone by announcing that he was going to the University of Kansas. Immediately, other college coaches started accusing Kansas of paying Chamberlain. Well, of course it was all sour grapes. Every one of those colleges was preparing to pay Chamberlain themselves. Apparently, those other colleges had not offered enough. During Chamberlain's freshman year, he was driving a two-year-old Buick, a nice car by any standard and certainly more expensive than what Chamberlain could have afforded. He also wore expensive clothes and dined at some very nice restaurants. The guy spent money like he was the president of the university, not a first-year student. It was not just other colleges that were accusing Kansas of breaking the rules and paying Chamberlain, it was also NBA teams. Walter Brown, the owner of the Boston Celtics, called for an NBA investigation of Will Chamberlain. He said that if the NBA could prove that Kansas paid Chamberlain, then Chamberlain should be banned from the NBA for life. Of course, it was not hard to see why the owner of the Celtics wanted this. The Celtics had just won their first championship with their superstar rookie, Bill Russell. Brown knew that he had a team that could win a lot of championships, and he did not want the Warriors to mess that up. By getting Chamberlain banned, or at least trying to get him banned, it would ensure that the Celtics would go unchallenged. Well, we all know that the Celtics won a whole bunch of championships anyway, but at the time in 1956, the Celtics were already afraid of a player who would not even enter the NBA for three more years. Now, Chamberlain and the university denied every single accusation thrown at them. They maintained that the only thing that Chamberlain was receiving was tuition, room, board, and $15 per month that he received for working on campus. But none of that explained how he seemed to always have so much money in his pocket. But nobody was ever able to prove anything against Chamberlain or the university. So did Kansas win those national championships that everyone predicted for them? No, they didn't. Chamberlain's sophomore year was also his first year on the varsity, and he took the team all the way to the national championship game against the University of North Carolina. To make a long story short, Kansas lost that game in three overtimes. North Carolina just surrounded Chamberlain with defenders and dared any other player to carry the load. And that strategy worked. Chamberlain came back for his junior year, and they failed to win it again. That gave Chamberlain just one more chance to win a national championship. But again, he shocked everyone and even the university by dropping out of school and joining the Harlem Globetrotters. He said that it was no longer fun to play college basketball where he was triple teamed on every single possession. He also wanted to make some money for real and the Globetrotters were offering him $64,000 for one year plus some bonuses. That was a lot more than the $4,000 that he was making at Kansas. Yeah, he admitted in the 1980s that three wealthy University of Kansas alumni pitched in to pay Chamberlain $4,000 per year 
plus a car to play for Kansas. Chamberlain never identified the three men, he just referred to them as the Godfathers. So it turned out that everybody was right. Kansas had paid Chamberlain, but by the time that Chamberlain admitted it 30 years after the fact, nobody really cared anymore. These are the lengths that some schools will go to in order to land a prized high school player. If you recall, I did a similar episode on Moses Malone and the massive circus that was his college recruitment. That was episode 77 in case you want to go back and check it out. Moses was taking money just to talk to coaches. You know, Bill Russell once said that most players make the mistake of thinking that they are getting paid to play basketball. Russell very correctly said, no, they are being paid to win. Because if they don't win, then they get cut or traded. Well, the same thing applies to coaches. College coaches are not getting paid to coach. They are getting paid to win. We all know this. If the coach does not win enough, he gets fired. The coach's employment, the way that he puts food on his table and keeps a roof over his family's head, all depend on a bunch of kids between the ages of 18 and 21. If he cannot bring in the right kids, he will be asked to move on. Now, please hear me on this. I'm not saying that coaches do not actually coach. Of course they do. Most coaches spend hours upon hours per week developing their players. But I hope you understand what I mean. If the coach is not winning, he will be replaced. When it comes to Chamberlain and his recruitment, I'm not saying that paying players is right. It is not. It is very wrong and goes against the spirit of the game. But what I am saying is that I understand the temptation, especially when we are talking about a generational player like Will Chamberlain or Moses Malone. But that is the world of big money sports. What is funny is that while Chamberlain made $64,000 for that one year with the Globetrotters, he actually took a pay cut when it was time to move on to the NBA. As a rookie for the Philadelphia Warriors, he made $27,000 plus bonuses. The Warriors would soon rectify that and within just a few years, Chamberlain became the first player to make $100,000 per year. The very next day, Bill Russell signed the new contract with the Celtics for $100,001. Russell wanted one more dollar than Chamberlain and Auerbach agreed to it. But that is a story for another episode. Well, that is the story of how Wilt Chamberlain was recruited for college, the NBA, and the Globetrotters, seemingly all at the same time. Join us next week when we revisit our two-part story on Bob Cousy with a follow-up interview with my good friend and fellow podcaster Dana Auguster of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even write an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do 
is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.